the question before us that's uh, in your program is this. How do we balance our founders' original visions and missions with the realities of the present day as we build for the future? Uh, I don't think it'll take any convincing in this room that ideas are powerful. The ideas and the plays are so powerful that the majority of us have uh, found ourselves dedicating our lives to the production of Shakespeare and to communicating about Shakespeare and educating about Shakespeare. If ideas are powerful, then the ideas that led to, uh, borrowing here from Tom Stoppard, uh, creating cathedrals to irrationality <laughs> that arts organizations are. So if an idea can be so powerful that, that our founders would do that, then how does the power of that energy, that intense creative energy, that intense vision, that, in, that intense social energy, how does that then play out through the life and the lifeblood of an organization? As you look towards the future, we also have a firm foot uh, in the past, having started there as an acting intern in the company uh, 20 years ago, making $1,800 for the entire season. <laughs> to now making twenty two hundred dollars. Uh, and so Friends Vision, along with uh, Mr. Phillips' vision, uh, have guided us. And you know, I think you'll all agree that nothing with the right people will inspire growth more than a firm hand of faith on your shoulders that you can do it. And we have been given that firm hand. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I mean, knowing that we're sitting in the middle of, you know, stepping into the shoes of someone who created this thing in rural Utah in uh, sort of the crossroads of, of many uh, wonderful national parks, and it, it truly is destination theater. Uh, and to know that we've been going for 50 years strong, people have been coming to this small little mountain town in, in southern Utah um, is a tribute to Fred. And so the last thing that we would want to do is, you know, paint the building neon green, you know, and, and do something out of the realm of what his initial vision was. Uh, I think David's absolutely 100% right that a lot of it for us now, currently, is just going along with our instincts and what has been with us from our, the moment we started working there, of his voice sort of in our head and, and on our shoulder and in support of what we've done. And a lot of it is also building what is truly an amazing patron base for the last 50 years. The demographic of our audience, our followers of Fred's vision, and the, the impact that Shakespeare has on all of us as human beings. Uh, I was an actor who had a passion for a certain kind of theater, which had to do with language. I would say a strong feminine perspective, and I didn't care whether people were men or women, but that women's ways of relationship and listening and all that stuff was clearly front and center, that it was a collaborative project and sometimes you had to be led and sometimes you were leading. And that the things that Shakespeare thought were important were where, what we were gonna put in the center of the theater, which is what kind of actor does it take to get out there and say his words and get the multiplicity of meanings and the humanity behind those words so that in fact what happens is the audience's lives open up even as the actor's li actor is using his or her own voice, body, psychological development and sheer imagination to play these parts. So it's really the relationship with the audience which is why the collaborative um, model and really com getting the voice out there, speaking the unspeakable, getting what's unconscious to consciousness, those were the, the kind of generating principles. Stepping aside and letting Tony do it is enormously, it's not difficult because I want him to do it, but how I negotiate my relationships with the people in the company that I've had them with for so long, how I negotiate my relationship with the board, we still haven't sorted that out. Principles is kind of an interesting one, I think, in our case, because um, originally we were created for economic reasons. 
um, our, our town, Stratford, Ontario, had been a railway town for 80 years. The railways were pulling out. The town was facing economic ruin, collapse, whatever. Um, and a local hero called Tom Patterson, who, who grew up in Stratford, came up with this idea of an economic stimulus, uh, a festival of Shakespeare's plays, to draw tourists, to draw their dollars, to save the town's economy. So the whole thing was not, as I understand it, originally rooted in any kind of artistic imperative. It was rooted in an economic imperative. This economic idea caught people's imaginations as, a, as, a, as something beyond that, as something, as, as Guthrie put it, beyond wealth and industry to give Canada something to be proud of. And that seemed to capture people's imaginations. And they all really got behind this. And suddenly the idea of not just doing it to make money, but to do it to, do, to be the best in the world um, caught, their, caught, caught fire. And that's what they then proceeded to do. And I think Pacter um, captured it well in your introductory when you talked about ideas have power. And I think the ideas of our, our founders, of Tyrone Guthrie and Tanya Mosevich, um, our, our founding artistic director and designer, I think that those ideas were passed from one artistic director to another. Um, and uh, it's evolved and developed today, and it's grown enormously as well. Um, the pillars of our mission today are around excellence and innovation um, in the production of Shakespeare and the classics, musicals, and big plays. Um, pretty much, uh, we were founded in 1953, or we had our first season in 1953, we did two Shakespeare's that first year. Pretty much from that time, the Playbill had diversified um, over that 60-year period. Um, we now have quite a focus on new plays, and in fact, I think there's three world premieres in our current season, um, and another three newish plays uh, in our season of 14, so it's pretty significant. We have four musicals in this forthcoming season, and three Shakespeare's. Um, so that's the, the composition of the, the playbill um, has changed over time. Um, but the notions of innovation and excellence are very much at the core. But, it, but that's an interesting question when we bring up about how we innovate around what we're supposed to serve, not just in terms of our programming, but in terms of who we serve. You know, so that's something to examine, I think, when you're looking at these, these kinds of things. And, and I think it's always a wee bit dangerous to, to sort of set out to be innovative. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because then it's forced. Yeah, right. um, but I think if you, if, you, if you can somehow, I think what, innov what true innovators do is they somehow manage to clear their mind of everything that's gone before and <clears throat> approach the words as if this was a fresh text handed to them, the ink is still wet, and somebody's just written this thing. How do I make this thing come alive on stage? But if you sit, sit down and think, okay, so Shakespeare's always been done this way, therefore I have to find another way, I don't know that you're going to come up with anything, you know, yeah. real. I, I just want to point out that Shakespeare himself did not believe in innovation, <laughs> per se, that he really took the text of Ovid and the Bible and Apuleius and repeated those patterns and his education was to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite that and how you actually copy the master and then maybe better the master was what he was doing a lot of the time and innovation for him was to go more deeply into what he was doing not try and change the picture of what he was doing. So there was a different depth. He was feeding off all the hundred people that are his, his source material, not saying, oh, well, I'm going to want better Hollinch Head. When you run a theater, your job is to move the organization forward. And how do you do that up against the, uh, you know, the founding vision? So can you please thank our panelists? Yeah.